Hey everybody, welcome to the Mana Leak. I am John, as always, and we are here for the M21 set review. Uh, we're going to do this a little bit differently. You can tell it looks a little bit differently. There's a chat up there. There's a grading thing over here. I'm here. I'm not usually here for the set reviews. Um, we are live on Twitch right now, which is why there's chat, uh, doing the entire M21 set review kind of off the cuff with way less uh, notes that I'm used to. And that's because the YouTube videos haven't been performing quite as well as I want them to, so I thought I'd just try something different. If this fails miserably, we'll go back to normal for Zendikar. If it works, we'll keep this. We'll continue doing this. Uh, maybe I'll pull in somebody to do a set review with, or somebody will pull me in to do a set review with. We will see. But today we're going to take a look at all of the gold cards and the white cards, and then we will do uh, additional videos for the rest. Uh, all those videos will be up within a much shorter period of time than normal. They're not going to come up every single day or one a day. Um, yeah, so let's get started with the uh, with the first card here. There is a grade thing, as you can see. This is chat voting in real time what grade they think the card should be. Um, but let's get going. So up first is Alpine Houndmaster. Alpine Hind Houndmaster is red white for a creature human warrior at uncommon. It's a two two. When Alpine Houndmaster enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a card named Alpine Watchdog and or a card named Igneous Cur. Reveal them, put them into your hand, then shuffle your library. When Alpine Houndmaster attacks, it gets plus X plus O until in a turn where X is the number of other attacking creatures. So it's 2-2 two, two for 2. Okay, that's standard. And it goes and finds you an Alpine Watchdog, which is a common, and an Igneous Cur, which is a common. And they're both okay cards. We'll get to them later. Um, but you have to have them, obviously. And whenever Alpine Houndmaster attacks, it gets plus X plus O for other attacking creatures. So it doesn't count itself. It doesn't attack as a 3-2. It seems okay. You know, this is the signpost on common for red white, which is play creatures and turn them sideways. So it's fine. I don't think it's super good. I think it's around probably like a C plus. I see people on B minus. I don't think it's quite a B minus just because you have to have those other cards to go off with this. Um, you don't get multiple Alpine Watchdogs. You get one Alpine Watchdog and you get one Igneous Cur. So I'm just on a C plus for this. I think it's fine. If you're red white, you'll play it. If you have those cards, or if you have this card first, you'll happily pick those cards up. But I don't think I'm going crazy over this. I think red-white is just going to do what it does with or without this card. Up next is Conclave Mentor. Conclave Mentor is green-white for a creature centaur cleric at Uncommon. It's a 2-2. Two -two. If one or more plus one plus one counters would be put on a creature you control, that many plus one plus one... That, that many plus one plus one plus one counters are put on that creature instead. When Conclave Mentor dies, you gain life equal to its power. So Green White's archetype is plus one plus one counters. There's a fair bit of decent plus one plus one counter stuff in the set. Now, so this will only ever add one more plus one plus one counter than whatever it is that you're getting, which generally will be one plus one plus one counter, so you'll get two instead. Obviously, if you're in that deck, this will help but it's not going crazy. It's still a 2-2 two, two for 2, so we're not you know, in any way bad on this, uh, but I think this one is much more deck dependent. Like if you are, if you happen to be a green-white deck and you are not full-on counters, this drops more to like a C, maybe C plus. If you are full-on plus one, plus one counters, every card gets them or gives them, we can go up to a B minus, but I think I'm just going to be on a C plus for Conclave Mentor here. It's not dragging me into this archetype. It's kind of more of a nice to have if I'm in that archetype. Whoa, that's zoomed in. Up next is Dire Fleet Warmonger. Dire Fleet Warmonger is one black red for a creature orc pirate at Uncommon. It's a 3 3. At the beginning of combat on your turn, you may sacrifice another creature. If you do, Dire Fleet Warmonger gets plus two, plus two, and gains trample until end of turn. Red Black is the sacrifice deck, which I love. There's one threatened card in the entire set, and it's uncommon, which means it's actually more black-red sack your own things, which is a much less favorite version of the deck for me. Still, this card's great. Like, you know, strong C plus here, and I might even go up to... I don't even think I might. I think I am just up to a B minus on this one. It's a 3-3 three, three for 3. Cool. I'll play that in a black-red deck. Black-red wants to turn sideways, usually. And a 3-3 three, three for 3, awesome. The fact that I can sack a creature that's no longer relevant to make this a 5-5 five, five trample, attacking on turn 4 a 5-5 five, five trample, is super, super solid as well. And as we'll see when we get into black-red, there are a lot of creatures that have die triggers. Or, you know, when they die, they replace themselves. When they die, they do damage. So I think this is actually decent. I think this is a B-minus. 
I think this is exactly what the black red deck is going to want, and I think there is a pretty darn good si uh, upside on this. Uh, as, uh, as you'll see when we get into black red, there is a good deal of die triggers. So B minus for Dire Fleet Warmonger. This one makes me excited about its archetype. The other two, yeah. Up next is Experimental Overlord. Overload. Experimental Overload is two blue red for a sorcery at uncommon. Create an XX blue and red weird creature token where X is the number of instant and sorcery cards in your graveyard. Then you may return an instant or sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand. Exile Experimental Overload. So I think I'm fine with this if it's a 2-2. I feel like we had a creature that I want to say was 5 mana for a 2-2 that returned an instant or sorcery in a core set at some point in Magic's history. I can't remember its name. So if this is a 2-2, I'm happy assuming the card that I'm bringing back is good. If it's a 3-3, a 4-4, a 5-5, etc., even better. I think this is obviously going to be super good in the blue-red spells deck. If you are not super spells, it's going to be a lot less good. Um, but yeah, this card just looks solid to me. The only time I'm going to be sad is if A, I can't cast it because it's a 0, zero or B, if it's a 1-1 one, one and it's not returning me something like unconditional removal. Beyond that, I'm pretty happy with it. So I think I'm on... I think I'm on a B-. minus. Returning instants and sorceries from your graveyard is just really good if they're good. You know, don't play a blue-red spells deck that is nothing but combat tricks and think that you're going to get there with this. So I think I'm going to go for a B- minus on this. Up next is Indulging Patrician. Indulging Patrician is one white-black for a creature vampire noble at Uncommon. She's a 1-4 with flying and lifelink. At the beginning of your end step, if you gained three or more life this turn, each opponent loses three life. This one's decent. It's a 1-4 flyer lifelink for 3. That's uh, fine stats. That's relatively defensive, but it's fine stats. So now, you need to gain 3 or more life to make your opponent lose 3 life. There is, obviously, black-white life gain is a deck, but we'll, we'll, we'll see when we get through white and black how much lifelink there is and how many ways there is to definitely trigger this. My concern here is if you are reliably gaining 3 or more life, that means you are probably smacking your opponent in the face with your lifelinkers. Making this card win more. Making this card way win more. Because if you're already attacking, if you're already smacking in, you're just not... You don't need this card as much. It's gravy. It'll end the game faster. Um, but I, I don't think it's incredible. I don't think it's insane. There is Revitalize in this set, but you should never play Revitalize. Period. Um, I think this is still B minus. I think this is still decent. There is a fair bit of incidental life gain. I just don't know about reliably getting three constantly. Now, even if you get three once, this might be good. So I'll keep it at a B minus. I'll keep an eye on it. I think people are going to overrate this at the start and come down on it. I think some people might be as high as like a B plus or A minus, but I think I'm going to start at a B minus on a Dilching Patrician. Up next is Leafkin Avenger. Leafkin Avenger is two red green for a creature elemental druid at uncommon. It's a 4 3. Tap to add green for each creature you control with power 4 or greater. So at least one green mana, generally, assuming nothing bad happens to this guy. Pay 7 red. Leafkin Avenger deals damage equal to its power to target player or planeswalker. Interesting card here. Red green's uh, archetype is big things. And this is a thing that is medium sized and cares about bigger things so mana dorks obviously i really want them to be one mana or two mana three mana if they're really good four mana is asking a bit but at least it's a four three so it's a relevant body the cool thing here is that it doesn't have to tap to do the uh, uh lava axe ish thing so you can tap this for the mana and then use that mana for the seven and red activated ability which means this does have some inevitability on it you know if your opponent lets the game go a little bit long and you can tap this for three-ish mana you represent at least eight damage at the end of their turn and the start of your turn so end of their turn tap your mana deal four assuming this hasn't been buffed start of my turn tap eight mana deal four eight mana is a lot and mana sinks are very good so i think leafkin adventure is a b minus i think it slots into that red green deck um you want stuff that you're going to ramp to you obviously don't want to be like red green aggro like lower aggro with this you want to be red green stompy with this but i think in that deck it can be a b minus for sure so yeah b minus for leafkin adventure 
Mana sinks are good. Don't forget about that. We haven't had a ton in the last year or so, but they're really good. Up next is Lore Scale Quaddle. Lore Scale Quaddle is one green blue for a creature snake on common. It's a 2 2. Whenever you draw a card, put a plus one plus one counter on Lore Scale Quaddle. So, so, so. Red Black is Sacrifice. You have to do this and then this and then this and have this card down and then you go off with that archetype. And Red Green, you have to, you know, play these cards to ramp up to these cards. Green Blue? You have to draw cards, which you do every single turn by the rules of magic. I think that Green Blue has a, a good chance of being one of the best archetypes just because it's something you literally have to do as per the rules of magic, which is draw cards. So Lore Scale Quaddle can get out of hand very fast. This is a 3-3 three, three for 3 the first turn that it attacks at least. Instant speed draw effects make this bigger. So your one in a blue draw card at instant speed is actually now a combat trick. Lore Scale Quaddle is great. I think it's a B. I think B plus is reserved a little bit more for answer it now or you die. You know, it's the bombs that... Well, no, I guess bombs are A's. Well, you're trying to you're trying to push me to B plus here. Um, I'm th I think I'm going to stick on B just because it does take a couple of turns to get going, but then it's terrifying. Strong B for lore scale Quaddle. It's just super super good. Um, I my early pick is that green blue is going to be one of the strongest archetypes. Up next is Nyambi Esteemed Speaker. Nyambi Esteemed Speaker is white blue for a legendary creature human cleric at rare, so she's not one of the signpost on commons. She's a 2-1 with flash. When Nyambi Esteemed Speaker enters the battlefield, you may return another target creature you control to its owner's hand. If you do, you gain life equal to that creature's converted mana cost. Pay one white blue tap, discard a legendary card, draw two cards. Meh. She's a 2-1 for 2 with flash that can save a creature of yours, I suppose, and maybe gain you some life, or perhaps, you know, assuming you pay to recast that creature, you can re-trigger the ETB effect. There's not that many legendaries. There's there's no, like, uncommon or common legendaries kicking around. They're mostly rares, so you're not going to be discarding a bunch to this. So I think this is this is kind of the token... Here is a commander card for all the commander players' card, or, or, or card of the set. So I think she's around, like, a... A C. She's a creature that you could play if you wanted to, but I don't think you're going to go nuts with it. There is a Shrine Cycle add-on common, but we'll talk about those. I don't think they're that good. Did I give a rating for that? C? C. For Niambi, a Steam Speaker. Up next is Obsessive Stitcher. Obsessive Stitcher is one blue-black for a creature human wizard add-on common. She's an 0-3. Tap, draw a card, then discard a card. That's right. It's a looter, and you don't pay anything to loot. Wild! Two blue black, tap, sacrifice obsessive stitcher, return target creature card from your graveyard straight to the battlefield. Blue black is reanimator. There are gigantic blue things in this set. There's some gigantic black things in this set. There are ways to mill. She herself helps you mill. Free looting is not something we've had for a very long time. We uh, had facet reader in the last set, which I think we had to pay one generic mana to loot. Free looting is nutty. This is just a fantastic card. I think it's a, a strong B, I think. The fact that you can draw to your removal, discard your big things, and know that you're going to get that big thing back is super, super good. You can even activate her reanimation at sorcery speed. I think she's a strong B. It looks like somebody has uh, figured out that strong B is clicking on the slash between B and B+. Strong B. For obsessive stitcher up next is rada heart of keld rada is one red green for a legendary creature elf warrior at rare so not an on a signpost on common here she's a three three as long as it's your turn rada of heart of keld has first strike you may look at the top card of your library any time shouldn't that say at any time you may look at the top card of your library any time and you may play lands from the top of your library Pay four red green, Rada gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of lands you control. So she's a three three for three with a uh, half first strike, which is super solid, and I love playing lands off the top of my library. Obviously, a lot of the times that we have that effect, we also get an additional land play, so this is less good than Corsair of Crew Fix or things like that, but 
it's still pretty good to uh, just fix the top of your deck like that. You're basically drawing extra cards in red green. And then, yeah, if you can pay four red green and give her plus X plus X, that's great. She has no trample, which, you know, means your opponent can just block her forever, but even death strike or death touch is not going to stop her. So I think she's very, very strong. I think she could probably go into the a minus range she's around an a minus or a b the trick is she is small to begin with she does die to to common removal common cheap removal in this set so i think i will keep her at a b plus um, but if she's not answered she's going to represent significant amounts of card advantage and significant amounts of damage so b plus for rada heart of keld up next is Sanctum of All. Sanctum of All is white, blue, black, red, green for a legendary enchantment shrine at rare. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may search your library and or graveyard for a shrine card and put it onto the battlefield. If you search your library this way, shuffle it. If an ability of another shrine you control triggers while you control six or more shrines, that ability triggers an additional time. So there is one shrine in each color. They are all legendary. They are all on common, and they're all fine I, I i have looked through all of these cards at least once sometimes twice i don't think any jumped out at me as being good but they're all fine now the odds of you actually having all six because there are only six and the odds of you having a five color deck that in any way functions is just out the window this is an f this is an f like it's an absolute f if you pull it off awesome send me a screenshot but f f -ity f f f f f up next is Twin Blade Assassins. Twin Blade Assassins is three black green for a 5-4 creature elf assassin, assassin at uncommon. At the beginning of your end step, if a creature died this turn, draw a card. So black green's uh, archetype is play magic and kill things. Um, yeah, it's a 5-4 five, for five, which is fine-ish. Doesn't quite pass the uh, uh, vanilla test. But if you're killing stuff, if your opponent's chump blocking, you're drawing cards, or a card. If you're killing stuff, you're drawing a card. This card's just fine. I don't think it's amazing by any stretch of the imagination. I'm having a bit of trouble getting it up to a B- minus here. But I think it is strong enough that we can't go for C+. 5-4 is just big, and 5 mana is not the worst. So I think I will go for a B- minus on Twin Blade Assassins. It's just kind of the mid-range card that every mid-range deck would love, right? Let's go B- minus on Twin Blade Assassins. Kind of like a lot of these archetype cards, this one isn't drawing me into the archetype. This one's just like, oh, I'm here, and this card came around. Cool. Awesome. Up next is Watcher of the Spheres. Watcher of the Spheres is white-blue for a creature bird wizard at Uncommon. It's a 2-2 flyer. Creature spells with flying you cast cost one less to cast. Whenever another creature with flying enters the battlefield under your control, Watcher of the Spheres gets plus one, plus one until end of turn it doesn't get a counter unfortunately now this is one that pulls me into the archetype this one is where i pick it up and i go ho ho flyers are gonna make things amazing whereas the black green one is me picking up the card and going okay well i guess i'll pick removal which i was gonna pick anyways which everybody else is picking so it's gonna be hard this one is very solid obviously going to build some very good blue white flyer uh cards here we can't go to an a for this because it's not crazy on its own but it's going to give you a huge amount of value and if it is a 3-3 you know most turns that attacks that's awesome the rare time that it's a 4-4 is going to be really nice but this just really 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 builds up those flyer decks they stack as well now they are on commons which means you can only ever really expect one per draft sometimes you'll get two if you get more than that you should go buy a lottery ticket um but yeah i think this is like a a, a b minus for that deck and if you're blue white I think it's just always a B minus. So yeah, let's go B minus for Watcher of the Spheres. So that's gonna wrap it up for the multicolor. We get to move on to the only colorless non-artifact, which is Ugin the Spirit Dragon. Ugin the Spirit Dragon is eight generic mana for a legendary planeswalker Ugin at Mythic. He starts with seven loyalty, doesn't quite pass the vanilla loyalty test. Plus two, Ugin the Spirit Dragon deals three damage to any target. Minus X, exile each permanent with converted mana cost X or less that's one or more colors. Minus 10, you gain seven life, draw seven cards, then put up to seven permanent cards from your hand onto the battlefield. Ugin's nuts. Ugin is just nuts. I played with him in Fate Reforged? He was dead in Cons of Tarkir. So Fate Reforged, I played with Ugin and he was fantastic. Absolute bomb. Yes, eight mana is a lot, but... 
you can build around it. You know, build a slow controlling blue black deck, build a ramping green deck. He's colorless. He can go in any deck as long as you can get to eight. And as long as you can get to eight, he is an A plus slam dunk. First pick every time. A plus for Ugin, the spirit dragon. All right, moving on into white. So this will be uh, where we finish up the video at the end of the white cards, and then I'll see you all for blue on the next video. Uh, first is Alpine Watchdog. This is the creature that the Hound Master, whose name I forgot, did she have a name? I don't think she had a name. Um, goes and fetches one of these. Alpine Watchdog is one in a white for a creature dog at common. It's a 2-2 with Vigilance. This is a bear with an upside, which forever was a C+, but we have now learned bear with an upside is no longer a C+, because a bear with no upside is no longer a C. So this is just a C. It's very, very, very filler card. There is a dog lord that we'll talk about soon, but there's just not enough dogs to build the dog deck. So this is a C. It's filler. There's not much else to say about it. Up next is Angelic Ascension. Angelic Ascension is one and a white for an instant at uncommon. Exile target creature or planeswalker. Its controller creates a 4-4 white angel creature token with flying. I read the first sentence of this and got very excited. But we don't want to be giving our opponent 4-4 flying angels all the time. So there is going to be some interesting stuff going on here where sometimes your opponent has a 7-7 flyer. And this helps. <laughs> it may not help enough, but it helps. Of course, you can use this on your own stuff. And there are going to be terrifying turns where, you know, you play your 1-1 one, one for 1 on turn 2. You play this, and now you have a 4-4 four, four flyer on turn 2. It's going to be like solid footing, which ultimately is not great. Where, yes, sometimes you have a 5-5 five, five on turns 2, but other times you have crud. So this is one that I'm going to have to play with to really think. I think people are going to massively overrate this, forgetting about the fact that there's a lot of bounce and such in blue, meaning I don't care about your angel because I bounce it and now I have two for one to you. So I'm going to have to see how this plays out. My instinct is that this is going to be around like a C or C+. Plus. It's not going to be as good as people want. There are going to be games where you lose because this happened on turn two, and you didn't have bounce or whatever, and it's going to suck, but that's magic. Magic's high variance. Um, so yeah, C plus for this. I'm going to give it a go. It could go higher, and I, de I definitely think it could go lower, but we'll see. I think it's going to feel like solid footing. Up next is Anointed Chorister. Anointed Chorister is a single white mana for a creature human cleric at common. It's a 1-1 one -one with lifelink. Pay four and a white. Anointed Chorister gets plus three, plus three until end of turn. So 1-1 one, one for 1 that, hey, we could turn into an angel on turn 2. Um, yeah, 1-1 one, one for 1 with lifelink I do not care about. 4 and a white to give it plus 3, plus 3. It's a mana sink. It's something to do with my mana later, but I don't know I don't know what deck this super goes into. Like, obviously it's meant for the black-white life gain deck, but gaining 1 life a turn isn't super exciting, and then gaining 4 life a turn for 5 mana... I don't know. I think this is relatively filler. I think it's around like the C to C minus range. I think I think there's just better cards to play in the deck that this is designed for and outside of the deck that it's designed for. I think there's a massive amount of better cards. So C minus for Anointed Chorister. Up next is Avon Gaggle Master. Master of the Gaggles. Avon Gaggle Master is three white white for a creature, bird, warrior, and uncommon. It's a 4-3 flyer. When Avon Gaggle Master enters the battlefield, you gain two life for each creature you control with flying. 4-3 flyer for five that gains me at least two life, potentially more. Cool. Great. This isn't... This is for the, the black-white life gain deck, but really it's for the blue-white flyers deck, or literally any deck that wants to attack with flyers. This card just seems solid. It's it's around a, a B? B feels a little bit high, but it might just be a B. 4-3 flyer for 5. Gains me 2 life. Yeah, I think it is around a B. I agree with you. Magical heat map going on there. B for Avon Gaggle Master. I think it's just going to be a great in every white deck, and occasionally it's going to do amazing work in the black-white life gain deck, and occasionally this will be four mana because you're the blue-white flyers deck and you played your bird wizard guy first. B for Avon Gaggle Master. Up next is an A+. Up next is Basri. All right. Baneslayer Angel is 3 white white for a creature angel at Mythic. It's a 5-5 five five with flying first strike, lifelink, protection from demons and dragons. It's a 5-5 five five for 5 with flying first strike and lifelink. 
it's real good. It's always been real good. There's There was a reason that there was the Baneslayer Angel test way back when. Protection from demons and dragons doesn't matter much. There's some. There's some in the set. But this is just nutty. It's a slam dunk for a, uh, first pick. It's an A+. Plus. You go into white for this. A+, plus for Baneslayer Angel. Up next is Basri Ket, our first Planeswalker, a new Planeswalker from Amon Ket. Basri is one white white for a legendary Planeswalker. Basri at Mythic, three loyalty, passes the vanilla Planeswalker test. Plus one, put a plus one plus one counter on up to one target creature. It gains indestructible until end of turn. I would have thought lifelink. Minus two, whenever one or more non-token creatures attack this turn, create that many one one white soldier creature tokens that are tapped and attacking. Minus six, you get an emblem with, at the beginning of combat on your turn, create a 1-1 one, one white soldier creature token, then put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control. So three loyalty for three mana, you tick him up to one, so he's at four, and you have put a counter on something that momentary is momentarily is indestructible. That's fine. Alternatively, you could immediately tick him down if you're attacking to make 1-1 one, one soldiers. The issue here that I always have with cards like this is... It's amazing when you're already ahead. When I can attack with five creatures because I'm not in a board stall because my opponent's not going to blow me out. Yeah, I get another five and that's cool. But whatever. So yeah, he doesn't do anything without a board. Yeah, he's fine. You know, we're, we're talking about is this an A or is this a B? We're not going into C or D or F for this. Um, his ultimate is really good, assuming again you have a board. But I think the fact that he requires a board is that he is around a B plus. Obviously, there's very little that's good if you're playing a white deck and you don't have a board. So we can't do much about that. Um, but yeah, I, I think he's a B plus. Just be aware that occasionally you're going to have this guy in your hand, nothing on the board, and you're just going to kind of feel sad. But he's probably high variance enough and snowball -y enough that you still just always first pick him. So B plus for Basri Cat. Up next is Basri's Acolyte. Basri's Acolyte is two white white for a creature cat cleric at common. It's a 2-3 with lifelink. When Basri's Acolyte enters the battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on each of up to two other target creatures you control. So if I'm not getting any value out of this, I'm unhappy. I don't want to play a 2-3 lifelink for four. That's filler. I'll, I'll play it if I have to, but it's filler. If I'm getting one counter off of it, I'm probably fine probably goes up to a C plus there and if I am getting both counters I think this is a B minus so you have to make sure you're in a go wide deck you need to make sure that you are definitely getting creatures on the board at which point I think you can push to B minus on this um, but if you're not I don't know boy I hate high variance like that but this is really how magic's kind of going so let's go C plus on it let's go C plus for Basri's Acolyte I think there's just too many times where you're not going to get full value, and not getting full value out of this sucks. Half value is okay. Now, obviously, the lifelink helps out, but we'll, we'll, we'll have to see how much the lifelink matters, because, of course, we saw the signpost on common wanting us to gain life. We haven't seen anything wanting us to gain life just yet. I know there are things coming up, though. So, yeah, let's go Let's go C+, Basri's Acolyte. Up next is Basri's Lieutenant. Basri's Lieutenant is three and a white for a creature human knight at rare. It's a three, four vigilance protection from multicolored. As you saw, there's not much multicolored in this set. There's 10 uncommons and a couple of rares. When Basri's Lieutenant enters the battlefield, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. Not other. It could be on itself. Whenever Basri's Lieutenant or another creature you control dies, if it had a plus one, plus one counter on it, create a two, two white knight creature token with vigilance. So if this is a 3-4 for four, 4 that puts a counter on something and then maybe makes me some knights if those creatures dies, it's pretty darn good. And if this is a 4-5 for four, 4 that makes some knights if things die that have counters, cool. It's got vigilance. I think it's like a B plus. I don't think we're going to A range for this. I don't think this is a bomb. This isn't something that your opponent has to answer like that turn. Your opponent can chump this for a while. Your opponent could pacify this, or not pacify, but face fetters or whatever. I think it's just a B plus. It's not in the bomb range. It's just a very, very good card. So B plus for Basri's Lieutenant. And yes, it can put a counter on itself, which means it can be a 4-5, which is pretty good stats for 4 mana. Up next is Basri's Solidarity. Basri's Solidarity is 1 and a white for a sorcery at Uncommon. Put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on each creature you control. 
So that's good, but again, the whole Basri problem is we need to have a board state. If I'm putting a plus one plus one counter on a creature, this is awful. If I'm putting them on two, that might be fine. I liked Dragon Scale Boon back in the day. Now remember, Dragon Scale Boon was instant and untapped the creature. Um, but then if I am getting more counters, that's just gravy. So yeah, if it was an instant, it would be significantly better. I'd like it quite a bit more. I think this is around like a C plus, but again, it's going to be one of those cards where some board states, this is just going to make the game go from being over to being over. And in some board states, this is going to be a card you can't cast. So I guess we go C plus, but you need to be very on that build a board state plan. You need to have token producers. You need to have plans for always having a board state. Up next is Celestial Enforcer. Celestial Enforcer is two and a white for a creature human cleric at common. She's a two, three. Pay one and a white tap. Tap target creature. Awesome. Activate this ability only if you control a creature with flying. Not awesome. Um, yeah, this is explicitly dependent on your deck. Are you the blue white flyers deck? Do you have at least, I don't know, seven, eight flyers? Cool. This card's pretty good. It's not a free tapper. It's not a one mana tapper. It's a two mana tapper, which is getting expensive. But I believe Fanbearer was a two mana tapper. Um, but yeah, I think this is like a. I think this is like a C plus. Um, yeah, I think this is a C plus in uh, in the flying deck. This is a C plus just because your opponent can turn it off. It is uh, a more expensive tapper. Um, but I think it is a C plus in that deck. If you are dropping below, you know, seven, eight flyers, this drops way low. This drops to like C minus, you should not play it. So C plus if you uh, have the flyers needed. Up next is Concordia Pegasus. Concordia Pegasus is one and a white for a creature Pegasus at common. It's a one, three flyer. One, three flyers for two are okay, but not incredible. Um, there, there's better ways for you to enable your flying deck. There are better ways for you to put counters on things. You know, put put your counters on a 2-2 two, two flyer. That's better than a 1-3 flyer. There's better things. This is kind of your, uh-oh, I didn't quite get there, and I need some more flyers. Or, uh-oh, I need some more creatures. So it's kind of the definition of a C- minus to me. It's a card that you should cut frequently. Very, very, very frequently. But it's a creature. You can play it. C- minus for Concordia Pegasus. Up next is Containment Priest. Containment Priest is one and a white for a creature human cleric at rare. It's a 2-2 with flash. If a non-token creature would enter the battlefield and it wasn't cast, exile it instead. So Black Blue is the reanimator deck. So this interestingly does have some sideboard applications in this limited format. This is obviously way more a constructed reprint. Um, but I think this does have like a not even a D plus because it is a two two flash for two. I think this is a C minus. I think you can probably main deck this um, generally. Uh, and in fact, I guess flash is an upside, so we can go up to C. Bears with upsides are C's now. We can go up to C, and occasionally you're going to find yourself sitting across from blue black, and you're going to say, "Ho ho ho! Oh, you pay your five mana to reanimate something, and I'm going to slam this down and say, uh uh." No, you're not. So this is a C, and occasionally it's going to be a very nice surprise for you and not for your opponent. Up next is Daybreak Charger. Daybreak Charger is one and a white for a creature unicorn at common. It's a 3-1. It's a unicorn? Oh, it does have a horn. When Daybreak Charger enters the battlefield, target creature gets plus 2, plus 0 oh until end of turn. It's a 2 mana 3-1. I love 2 mana 3-1s. You know that. If I'm playing aggro, I want 2 mana 3-1s. They attack really well. They don't block well. Oh well. I'm not blocking. I'm attacking. I'm the aggro deck. And they kind of do block well. Once. Um, plus 2, plus 0 to another creature is cool. Unfortunately, if I'm playing this on turn 2, I'm probably not getting that value. <laughs> but later in the game, it does give me a little bit of value. So I think this is just a C plus. Um, and that's a C plus for me because I love 3 ones for 2. I think realistically it's a C. But yeah, aggro decks are going to love this. And if you're not an aggro deck, eh. Which white deck is this even supposed to go into? Red, white, aggro. Defiant Strike is up next. Defiant Strike is a single white mana for an instant at common. Target creature gets plus one, plus O oh, until end of turn, draw a card. Never been a big fan of Defiant Strike. I really want my plus one, plus O oh combat tricks to give first strike or to give uh, death touch or something. Draw a card. I mean, those are good words, but eh. 
This is a, a boring run-of-the-mill combat trick. One of the ones that you should only play if you really have a slot for it. Otherwise, just play better cards. Um, this is like a C minus. C minus for Defiant Strike. Up next is Dub. <sighs> Dub. Two and a white. Enchantment aura. Common. Enchant creature. Enchanted creature gets plus two, plus two, has first strike, and is a knight in addition to its other types, and makes me cry when I play Dominaria a lot. Um, this card was a scourge in Dominaria, uh, but I believe it was mostly in Arena, because in Arena, the bots wouldn't pick it, and so you would face decks where people had, I don't know, five of these, and they'd put all five on a creature, and you didn't have removal, and you'd die. Um, yeah, it, it's a fine card. You know, plus two, plus two, and first strike is an okay aura but it has all the problems that auras have you're gonna get blown out by removal you're gonna get blown out by bounce so it's just a c maybe even a c minus i still don't think it's very good there's no real enchantment support so i'm pretty iffy on dub uh, i'm still gonna lose to it a lot and it's gonna suck but c minus for dub up next is Faith's Fetters. Faith's Fetters is three and a white for an enchantment aura at uncommon. Enchant permanent. When Faith's Fetters enters the battlefield, you gain four life. Enchanted permanent can't attack or block, and its activated abilities can't be activated unless they're mana abilities. This is the card that everybody will say isn't as good in this format as usual, and it still is good. Four mana for an arrest. I'll pay that. I feel like we have paid that. I feel like Suppression Bonds in Origins was four mana. Possibly not even for this effect. It might have just been for a pacifism. Um, gaining four life is just gravy on top of it. Helps out the black-white life gain deck. But this is just great um, white removal. This is going to be a first pick in some packs if the rare is not good and there's not other unconditional removal. It's just a very, very strong, I think, B+, plus, to be honest. I see y'all are on B, but I play Faith's Fetters like a B+. Plus. Four mana, don't care. Love this card. B+, plus, Faith's Fetters. Up next is Falconer Adept. Falconer Adept is three and a white for a creature human soldier at uncommon. It's a two, three. Whenever Falconer Adept attacks, create a one, one white bird creature token with flying that's tapped and attacking. Four mana for a two, three. Not a fan of that. When it attacks, I make a bird. And then what? It dies? Or I'm attacking into an empty board and that's cool, so I'm winning more. So I, I'm not stoked on this. I think people will be best case scenario mentality on it. It's still a C plus. You know, it's still a totally fine card because the times that I can attack are going to be amazing. You know, we're not going to go C on this. We're not going to go C minus on this, but we're not going to go into the B range either. I think the C plus, it's going to be, you know, a nice little thing for the Flyers deck. It's going to help you get a couple more Flyers going. It'll be a nice thing for the green white counters deck. You can get counters on those birds. Um, you're obviously going to want to use combat tricks on your Falconer Adept. Um, but yeah, it's a fine card. It's a C plus, but it's probably not going to be as good as you hope it'll be. And sometimes it'll be better than you ever expected. Up next is Feet of Resistance. I love this card. Feet of Resistance is one and a white for an instant at common. Put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. It gains protection from the color of your choice until end of turn. Let's count the ways that I love this card. A, my opponent's casting removal on a card. I play this. It gets a counter and doesn't die. B, I'm in combat and my creature's going to die. I play this and it gets a counter and it may not die. And or not going to die because it has protection. C, I have a 6-6 six, six green creature. My opponent has black creatures. I cast this. My green creature is now unblockable. There are so many things this card does. So many things. I love Feet of Resistance. It's a, a very, very good card. I don't think I can go to B. I'm talking this up quite a bit, but I don't think I can go up to B. Um, it's the strongest of C pluses. It's the strongest of C pluses. I don't know if I'd go to B minus on this, but it's a very, very, very strong C plus. It does so many things and it is so versatile. I'll play multiple copies of this very happily. Strongest of C pluses for Feet of Resistance. Up next is Gale Swooper. Gale Swooper is three and a white for a creature Griffin at common. It's a three, two with flying. When Gale Swooper enters the battlefield, target creature gains flying until end of turn. Three, two flyer for four. We call that snapping Drake. I think, um, and something else gets flying, cool. If I'm playing the flying deck, my other things probably also have flying, but if I have something on the ground, cool, it gets to fly as well. It's relatively, uh, you know, filler is not exactly the right word. I think C plus is the right word. You'll play this generally always. It's just a fine card. It's not one I'm going out of my way for, but C plus for Gale Swooper. 
Up next is Glorious Anthem. Glorious Anthem is one white white for an enchantment at rare. Creatures you control get plus one plus one. Anthems are great. Cheap anthems are great. Just giving all your creatures plus one plus one. This is fantastic. You'll take this and you'll go into every white deck. Your counters decks, they're going to be even bigger without counters. Your flying deck, they're going to kill your opponent faster. Your red white aggro deck, you're going to kill your opponent faster. Your creatures are going to survive more. Uh, the other deck, black white, life gain, cool. You gain more life. Anthems are great. It's an A minus. Um, it is real bad when you're losing, of course, if you don't have a board state, womp womp. But if you don't have a board state, most cards are womp womp. So A minus for Glorious Anthem. I think you do first pick this and get yourself into an aggro deck. Up next is Griffin Airy. Griffin Airy is one and a white for an enchantment at Uncommon. At the beginning of your end step, if you gain three or more life this turn, create a 2 2 white Griffin creature token with flying. Hey, look at that! We're 40 minutes in and we found our second payoff for life gain. So we have to gain three life, and if we do, we get a 2 2 flyer. This is saved by the fact that it only costs two mana, I think. You're not like spending a massive turn to get this on the board. But boy, you need to be sure that you're gaining life. I think the life gain deck is the one that I'm the most curious about because I feel like there is an amount of stuff that kind of really has to go right for you to start going off as well with the life gain deck isn't just gaining a ludicrous amount of life constantly its own payoff so I don't know about this card I'm gonna have to play with it obviously it only goes in the life gain it literally doesn't go in any other deck whatsoever so we're only gonna rate it based on that life gain deck and I'm gonna start it around I guess I have to start it around a B plus with the expectation that you are definitely gaining a lot of life I still don't want to play revitalize with this I just don't want to play revitalize and maybe that'll be wrong. Maybe I'm completely wrong about the black white life gain deck. And maybe maybe that three life thing that we've seen twice now is specifically because of Revitalize. Maybe Revitalize specifically makes that good. So let's go B plus if you're in that deck, if you're certain you'll go off with it. And I don't know how this is going to work out. Up next is Idol of Endurance. Idol of Endurance is two and a white for an artifact at rare. When Idol of Endurance enters the battlefield, exile all creature cards with converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard until Idol of Endurance leaves the battlefield. Pay one and a white tap until end of turn. You may cast a creature spell from among cards exiled with Idol of Endurance without paying its mana cost. It's the worst imitation of Luris ever. Um, so it's three mana. Anything that you want to cast with it has to be in the graveyard already. Like, anything that goes into the graveyard after this comes down doesn't become part of this, right? Exile all creature cards with converted mana cost three or less. Three. I'm out. I'm out on this. The fact that you already have to have a stacked graveyard of three drops or less before you can play this, and then you only get one a turn... I don't think it's any good. I don't think this is any good at all. I think this might be an F. I really think this might be an F. It just doesn't do enough, and... There's... It has to be that exact situation. You can't play this on turn 3. You probably can't play this on turn 4, or 5, or 6, or 7. Yeah, F. F, right of endurance. Up next is Legion's Judgment. Legion's Judgment is 2 and a white for a sorcery at common. Destroy target creature with power 4 or greater. This hits about 25% of the format, which means this is the d plusiest of d pluses ever. You should never, ever, 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 ever main deck this card. Ever. Because your opponent may literally have nothing that they can hit with it. Um, if, after this... You know, after game one, you see that your opponent is red green, or um, you know maybe they're blue black reanimator and they're reanimating eight eights or whatnot. Then you side this in, and it's going to be very good. But you never main deck this. There's just way too many decks that you'll miss on with this. So D plus for Legion's Judgment. Obviously, best of one on Arena. Do whatever you want because it's not real magic. Up next is Light of Promise. Light of Promise is two and a white for an enchantment aura at uncommon enchant creature. Enchanted creature has, whenever you gain life, put that many plus one plus one counters on this creature. Boy, this looks like a 
Let's see what chat does here. This looks like an overrating lightning rod. So I have to pay three mana for an enchantment. I have to not get blown out by playing this enchantment. Then I have to gain life. Then I have made a good card. I think that's way too many thens. I think the fact that there is an okay amount of bounce in this, I think the fact that there is a decent amount of removal. Wait till we get to red and you see how many creature burn spells there are in this set. I think this card is a total trap. I think it's around like a, a D minus. Um, again, it's going to be one of those cards where it's like your opponent played this, you didn't find your removal, and you get stomped by it. But basically any card can do that. Realistically, I think I'm playing this around like a D, which means I'm just trying to not play it. Yeah, just trying to not play it. Again, the lifelink deck is the one that I think I'm going to be the most wrong about because I think there's the chance that it's just it's high variance, but the high variance is so good on the high end that you just roll the dice and play it. But we'll see. I'm going to start in the D territory for this, so we'll see. Up next is Makeshift Battalion. Makeshift Battalion is two and a white for a creature human soldier at common. It's a 3-2. Whenever Makeshift Battalion and at least two other creatures attack, put a plus one, plus one counter on Makeshift Battalion. Get it? It has Battalion. We had this in Guilds of Ravnica, I think. It's a 3-2 for 3 that if you're aggro and attacking, it attacks better. It's a C-plus in an aggro deck. And if you're not an aggro deck, it's a C-minus. And that's about all there is. War of the Spark. War of the Spark. Up next is Mangara the Diplomat. Mangara the Diplomat is 3 and white for legendary creature, human, cleric, at mythic. It's a 2-4 with lifelink. Whenever an opponent attacks with creatures, if two or more of those creatures are attacking you and or planeswalkers you control, draw a card. That is commander speak. Whenever an opponent attacks with two or more creatures, draw a card. Whenever an opponent casts their second spell each turn, draw a card. This is, as Typical Sunday said, a sad mythic. It's a totally fine uncommon maybe even a slightly disappointing rare it's a very disappointing mythic it's a two four lifelink for four you know that's a card that is okay and if my opponent's attacking me a why are they doing so i have a two four like i'm probably going to attack or block pretty well if they're attacking me in the air with flyers i'm dead anyways um and then whenever my opponent casts their second spell each turn which isn't a super common thing in limited they get the draw card i think this is fine, but I think it's just a C plus. I think every white deck will happily play it, but I don't think it does enough else. Maybe B minus, just because it does kind of get you back in. If your opponent is attacking you with two or more things, getting to draw that extra card may be what you need. But it's me. It'll be a land. <laughs> C plus for Mangara the Diplomat. Up next is Nine Lives. Nine Lives is one white, white for an enchantment at rare. It's got Hexproof. If a source would deal damage to you, prevent that damage and put an incarnation counter on Nine Lives. When there are nine or more incarnation counters on Nine Lives, exile it. When Nine Lives leaves the battlefield, you lose the game. This is an F. This is, a, this is even more of an F than I thought because I thought it was if a source would deal lethal damage to you because that makes sense. You died and then you got another life. This is just if you take damage. This is horrible. This is an F minus. F minus for nine lives. Up next is Pack Leader. Pack Leader is one and a white for a creature dog at rare. It's a two, two. Other dogs you control get plus one, plus one. Whenever Pack Leader attacks, prevent all combat damage that we've dealt this turn to dogs you control. Obviously, if you're relatively aggressive with a decent number of dogs, this is going to be very solid. Your dogs are going to be a little bit bigger and they're going to be basically invulnerable in combat minus removal spells and such this will be a bit of a removal magnet it's just a very good card the trick is there aren't a ton of dogs in the set but there's probably just enough i think i counted four-ish commons which is probably enough to to kind of go off with this a little bit um you're still going to have to make sure that the way is clear so you're going to need to make sure that you've got some removal or maybe that you've got some trumpet blast or something going on or we don't have trumpet blast we have something else um but i think it's a b if you are you know very dog friendly of a deck if you have not enough dogs this is still fine it's still like a Oh, I guess if you have no dogs, it's a C minus. But if you have at least a couple of dogs, it gets into the C plus range. And if you do have a, a fair amount of dogs, it's in the B. So yeah, it, it's around. It's deck dependent. 
Up next is Rambunctious Mutt. Rambunctious Mutt is one of the common dogs. Three white white for a creature dog at common. It's a 3-4. When it ETBs, destroy target artifact or enchantment opponent controls. There's not too many artifacts and most of them suck. Um, there's not too, too many enchantments. But some of them are good. So this is a 3-4 for 5, which maybe does something. So I don't really want to play this. If I have pack leader, I think I lean towards playing one of these. And if I don't have pack leader, I, I think this is like a D plus. I think this is like a, a, a very expensive... Um, uh, why am I on Den Protector? Den Protector is not the original of that card. Rexage, which also probably isn't the original of that card. Um, yeah, it, it's a sideboard card. It's a D plus. If you happen to be dog friendly, you can put this, I think, one of these into your deck. But boy, it's expensive. Up next is Revitalize. Revitalize is one and a white, which is worse than I thought. I thought it was just a single white mana. For an instant at common, you gain three life, you draw a card. I hate Revitalize. This is a card that traps new players because they play it and they say, haha, I gained life. And then I hit you for four and nothing happened. I guess you drew a card off of it. In the black white life gain deck, this is where I think there's the chance for me being very wrong. Maybe if you do have both of those, you know, gain three life. Uh, do something cards here's a way to do it instantly without any other work and you get to draw a card as well so in those specific decks maybe this is around a c plus but i think you have to have those specific cards if you don't have those specific cards i think this is like a, a d minus or even an f but if you do have those specific cards maybe it is around a c plus but we'll see we'll see how it goes as i said i think i'm going to be most wrong about the black white life gain deck up next is Ruined Halo. Ruined Halo is white white for an enchantment at rare. As Ruined Halo enters the battlefield, choose a card name. You have protection from the chosen card name. This is a D plus? C plus? I th I'm confusing this one with another card. So you have protection from the chosen card name. So it is kind of like removal, actually. It's kind of like a pacifism, almost. Mmm, it is kind of like a pacifism. So they have a scary bomb down. I play this card. I have protection from that bomb. Yes, I have this confused with another card that I don't like. I think this might actually be around a B-. minus. This might actually be around a B-. minus. I guess... No, it does not turn the creature... Yes, it can still block, so it is half a pacifism. Yeah, I don't know. I've not played with Ruined Halo. I know it's a reprint. Let's go with a C plus. I think this is probably a little bit more removal. It's not exactly the Pithing Needle that I was thinking of. I think there's another Pithing Needle card in this format that I've uh, confused this with. It can still tap for mana. It can still do stuff. Um, but it can't attack you. can't cause damage to you. I think I'm okay with this as a C plus. I think you can play this. I don't think you're going out of your way for it, but I think you can play this. So C plus. Up next is Sanctum of Tranquil Light. Sanctum of Tranquil Light is a single white mana for a legendary enchantment shrine at uncommon. Pay five and a white tap target creature. This ability costs one less to activate for each shrine you control. So here's our monocolored shrine. Uh, these shrines are all legendary, so you can only play one of them. And they all have something that uh, increase based on the number of shrines that you have. Five and a white to tap a creature is too much. It's too much. Now, we're never paying five and a white because this counts itself. We're paying four and a white. Four and a white is too much to tap a creature. Um, if the format is ludicrously slow, maybe it is. Maybe it is. Uh, maybe five mana to tap is fine. I think we used to pay four mana to tap something. I don't know if we've paid five mana to tap something. Um, but there was a format where we did pay a lot for a tapper and it was okay. Um, but I don't know that that's going to be this format. If you have a second shrine, which would be the shrine in the color that you're playing with, so if you're playing white-green, you have the green shrine, four mana to tap is still a little bit expensive. So I'm relatively out on this shrine, and I think I am on most of the shrines. I, I can't remember what they all do at the moment. So let's go with a D-. minus. D-? minus. Let's go with a D on Sanctum of Tranquil Light. If you are a very slow deck, then I think you can maybe put this in if you have other ways of surviving. But I think uh, I think it's a little bit of a trap. Up next is Seasoned Hollow Blade. Seasoned Hollow Blade is one and a white for a creature human warrior at uncommon. He's a 3-1. Discard a card, tap Seasoned Hollow Blade. It gains indestructible until end of turn. My 3-1 for 2. 
is now indestructible. I love it. And all I have to do is discard a card. And it's going to be a land because I'm going to have 17 of them in my hand. Love it. Nice aggressive creature here. It's a C plus. We're not going any higher than a C plus. We're not crazy. Um, but it's a pretty darn good C plus. This thing's going to uh, do some work. It's going to block super well. It's going to have threat of activation. Your opponent's not going to want to block it with something that could trade knowing that you could just give it indestructible. It's not quite a Danto Vanguard, but it's pretty darn good, I think. Strong C plus for Seasoned Hallowblade. Up next is Secure the Scene. Secure the Scene is four and a white for a sorcery at common. Exile target non-land permanent. Its controller creates a 1-1 one, one white soldier creature token. Five mana, unconditional removal, hits planeswalkers and enchantments and whatnot. Awesome. My opponent gets a 1-1. One, one. Oh well. I don't care. Um, yeah, five mana is a lot. Sorcery speed's unfortunate, but we'll still play this. It's still going to be very good. I think this is like a strong B+. Plus. I don't think we can go to A-. minus because of five mana, I don't tend to go into the A range when mana or when removal's that expensive, unless there's something really good tacked onto it. And this does technically have a downside. Uh, Exiles as well, which is great, as opposed to destroying. Um, but yeah, I think it's just a very, very strong B plus for secure the scene. Up next is Selfless Savior. Selfless Savior is a single white mana for a creature dogged on common. It's a 1-1. Sacrifice Selfless Savior. Another target creature you control gains indestructible until end of turn. It's a 1-1 one, one for 1. No interest. It's a dog, so if I have the pack leader, it's a 2-2 two, two for two, 1. That's cool. And then I can save something at some point. My opponent knows that I'm going to save something at some point, which is unfortunate. So it is very much like Dauntless Bodyguard, which ultimately was a fine card, but not ludicrous it's definitely not a b plus i think i'm around like the c plus range um it's a fine card but it's not amazing by any stretch of the imagination uh it does get better the better your deck is the more bombs you have the better this is because the more things it can protect you know if, if your deck is nothing but three twos and a whole bunch of trumpet blasts selfless savior doesn't do much but if your deck is you know, a bunch of 4-4 four, four flyers with 7 abilities. It's, if it's a bunch of Baneslayer angels, you know, this does something. So yeah, C plus for Selfless Savior. Up next is Siege Striker. Siege Striker is 2 and a white for a creature human soldier at Uncommon. It's a 1-1 one, one with Double Strike. Whenever Siege Striker attacks, you may tap any number of untapped creatures you control. Siege Striker gets plus 1, plus 1 until end of turn for each creature tapped this way. Interesting card. You know, I don't like 1-1 one, one for 1, or 1-1 one, one for 3 death, double strike. If I tap a creature, 2-2 two, two double strike, eh, it's an okay card. 3-3 three, three double strike is where it's interesting. It goes up from there. The trick here is, when are you sitting with a big board state and not wanting to attack with everything and only wanting to attack with this, but also wanting to tap your board? That feels like an iffy situation. So I think I'm on like a C minus on this. I think it's a very cuttable card. I think it'll be a trap. People love reading double strike. People love the words double strike. And so I think you're going to see people overrate this. I, I know you're going to see people play this and jam a bunch of auras onto it and you're going to die. But I think it's a trap generally. So C minus for Siege Striker. Up next is Speaker of the Heavens. Speaker of the Heavens is a single white mana for a creature human cleric at rare. It's a 1-1 one, one with Vigilance and Lifelink. Tap. Create a 4-4 four, four white angel creature token with flying. Activate this ability only if you have at least 7 life more than your starting life total and only any time you could cast a sorcery. This is a 1-1 one, one Lifelink Vigilance for 1. A decent amount of the time. And that's not a good card. And then if you have 27 or more life, it's an angel every turn, which is a very good card. So this is going to be one of those high variance cards where I think you play it and you just assume everything is always going to be awesome and you're always going to win the game of magic. Because when this isn't good, it is deeply mediocre. So again... I don't know how to grade these cards. I don't know how to grade the black-white deck because of everything I'm reading about the black-white deck, every card I read screams to me, when you're doing amazingly, you're going to do even more amazing. And when you're not doing amazingly, when things aren't going your way, you're playing one ones for one. 
So I don't know, we'll see how it goes. I don't know if you can actually grade this. I think if you are a heavy duty black white life gain deck, this is like a B plus. If you guarantee that you're gonna be at 27 or more life, again, I already feel like you're winning at that point. Um, you're going to win more with this. So let's go B plus if you are in that deck for sure. If you can't guarantee that you're going to be at 27 plus life, good luck, I guess. Up next is Staunch Shieldmate. Staunch Shieldmate is a single white mana for a creature dwarf soldier. He's a 1-3 with flavor text. What deck is this for? <laughs> the aggro deck wants a 1-3 for one? Like, it wears counters not even well it wears counters okay you know a two four is cool i guess to c plus it's a creature that you can play it buys you time i guess not much time but it buys you some time so that's the kind of the definition of a c minus it's a creature that has power and toughness you can technically play it but you probably shouldn't c minus for staunch shield mate up next is swift response Swift response is one and a white for an instant at common destroy target tapped creature this is not a card that we usually get at instant speed this is a card we usually get at sorcery speed and i always have to tell people it's not that good because you had to get hit first you don't have to get hit first from this one you can do this during combat so it's kind of like divine arrow except you can't use this during blocks you can only use this during your opponent or you can do it you can use it during your blocks but you can't use it during their blocks um, but it's still very good we've never had it in instant speed says intangible that sounds correct to me i feel like we did have a conditional instant speed one perhaps um yeah good card's good i think it's like a b minus you know it's going to be kind of a pain because sometimes you're going to need removal but your opponent's not attacking you um but yeah b minus for switch response super cool to see this as instant speed up next is Tempered Veteran. Tempered Veteran is one and a white for a creature human knight at uncommon. It's a one to pay white tap, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature with a plus one plus one counter on it. It's the words win more on a card. Four white white tap, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature. One two for two, not a fan of that. Single white mana to tap to put a counter on something that already has a counter is great. If we are in the green white counters deck and we definitely have counters kicking around, single white mana to add a counter is fantastic. If we don't have counters, we're going to need to be pretty late game with her to get another counter in to at least start a creature growing. And it's still going to be a bit of a slow grow is kind of my issue here. I think she's fine. I think she obviously fits in the green white deck. Other decks may still want her, perhaps not aggro, just because six mana is kind of ludicrous. But yeah, I think you do have to build it around it a little bit, and I think you do have to put in a bit of work, and I think things can not go your way. But if things are going decently, I think she is around a B minus. He, there it's really blurry. Um, yeah, B minus if if you have counters, if you certainly have counters. If you just don't have counters, you probably don't play it. Up next is Valorous Steed. Valorous Steed is four and a white for a creature unicorn at common. It's a 3-3 three, three with Vigilance. When Valorous Steed enters the battlefield, create a 2-2 two, two white knight creature token with Vigilance. It's the Eldraine Unicorn, and it's Knight Friend on one card. It's a 5-5 five, five Vigilance for five. Cool. It's split on two cards. Probably cooler, because we have things that give counters to everything. We have things that affect everything card's just fine. You're not going to load up on it. You don't want a ton of five drops in your deck that wants this card, but the first one's a strong C+. It's a good card. Up next is Vryn Wingmare. Downgraded from rare. Vryn Wing Wingmare is a two and a white creature Pegasus at uncommon. For a 2-1 flyer, non-creature spells cost one more to cast. This is symmetrical. It affects you as well. It's a 2-1 flyer for three. That's okay. Like, that's a card that you'll play in your flyer deck. The non-creature spells co cost thing is not terribly impactful one more mana is not that big of an issue and it affects you just as much as it affects your opponent obviously you can build around it to not be too concerned about that but yeah i think it's just a two one flyer for three which is okay it's like a c c plus c plus for Vryn Wingmare. and yeah this used to be a rare in origins our final white card, I believe. Our final white card for the day is Warded Battlements. Warded Battlements is two and a white for a creature wall at common. It's an O3 with Defender. Attacking creatures you control get plus one, plus O. No? Pretty sure no. 
It's a, it's a wall, which I'm not stoked on in my aggro decks. It gives my attacking creatures plus one, plus oh. That's pretty cool. My flyers or my red-white ground creatures, whatever. That's cool. It costs three mana. As we'll see very... Well, not very shortly, but as we'll see on the red uh, set review, there's a three mana instant that gives plus two, plus oh. This gives it multiple times. But yeah, I don't think this is very good. I don't think any deck wants this. I think it's a D. I think you just don't play this. So D for Warded Battlements. So that's going to wrap it up for the white set review. I will be back in another video probably today or tomorrow with the blue set review. And the rest of the colors are going to come out in the next couple of days. We're not going to dole them out individually. Um, so make sure you let me know what cards you're excited about in white, what you're interested in playing, what you agree with, disagree with, etc. Go follow me on Twitch, like all the folks who used to be up there in chat who have gone quiet for the moment. Um, and you can see things like live set reviews like this. But check all that out, like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you all next time.